Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another edition of the live version of Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. I uh, hope everybody's had a good weekend and, and hope some places got to race. Uh, you know, boy, Mother Nature didn't wasn't kind to us here in Iowa, by all means. I mean, we lost pretty much about everything. They raced uh, I-80 out there in Nebraska on uh, Friday night, but I don't know if anybody actually really raced on, well, I guess Park Jefferson up in uh, Western Iowa raced. One of our stock car customers won up there. That was pretty exciting. And uh, so they, we did get some stuff out in Western Iowa race, but in the middle of Iowa, and it, it was pretty nasty here Saturday night. There were some pretty heavy storms that came through the area, and, and it was a good call on Boone Speedway's part to, to call it at noon on Saturday because uh, they would have had everybody there with the potential of a big mess because they had tornado warnings for Boone County and Story County and all that, which it just that just could have been a mess. I mean, it ended up not being a mess, but it could have been a mess. So, so how's Chad today? Good. I remember one of them Boone County tornado warnings at Super Nationals when I was in my camper there, uh, wondering if I was going to blow away and die. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're doing good. It was a uh, a good day around here, and. Uh, we released a new part today, so we're, we're excited about that. We we got our uh, control arm bushings done for the stock car guys, so that's awesome. the new metric, metric lower control arm bushing. So uh, 433M and then the 433M, or no, M, and then the 433L, which the L is the same in the Chevelle as it is in the metric, uh, so the rear is the same in both, uh, but these metric ones are ready to go now, so. That was something we've been working at for, well, guys like you've been yelling at us for him for a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, definitely was a uh, a needed area. We, uh, uh, you know, just one of those deals, you know. And and, and as we've uh, gotten more involved in the stock car market this year, you know, we we see some areas there which. You know, the guys that are building those cars are doing a great job. But, you know, there's always a deal where you can you can always take another look at things and look at things to see if that's any better. Did your screen just go goofy? Yeah, it popped up something about the questions and be live, and then it went away now. So I think we're good. Uh, awesome. It was, you're going to continue your manic Monday you had. Oh, uh, yeah. Today's <laughs> been one of them days, you know, I... I've always wondered, you know, like some guys, well, I'm doing pretty good for a Monday. And, and I'm like, what's this Monday have to do with anything? It's just another freaking day of the week. I mean, I, I don't understand. After today, I completely understand because it was just one of those days that uh, it was kind of a hurry up and wait type of day for everything for me. And it just was one of those deals. But anyway, so Scott chimed on, said they raced in Utah. Well, that's good. Hopefully, there's glad there's somebody doing some uh, good weather out there. Uh, Jim says it's still snowing in central Minnesota. Oh, man. Well, well there was fl flurries here this morning. I'd have to say I might complain about the 35-degree weather and 20 to 30-mile-an-hour winds, but uh, – <laughs> I don't know if this is what's going to happen for everybody, but that was strange. But uh, so, you know, I, I, anyway, you know, there's always some places that have worse than what we have it right there. It's just, you know, like I was telling you earlier, that wind, man, I tell you what, that just wears you out. So uh, new parts, we got that. That's pretty cool. Um, but looking forward to them. I know, uh, the, like I said, the last time when they assembled that second stock car, they were mentioning something about that, that they definitely needed some more bushings. I don't know what's going on here.
Got screen issues or what? I have no idea what's going on. Snowing and raining in Manitoba, Canada. Well, glad you're in Manitoba, Canada, and I'm um, personally glad I'm probably not. <laughs> Snowing and rain would just not be, you know, we had that last week, and it was just kind of one of those deals where, of course, you know, I just, I had just, um, yeah, Rocky chimed on and said, punch the computer. Sometimes that works. Yeah, it's, I don't know what's going on tonight. Like I said, maybe this is another one of those deals. But but anyway, uh, um, we kind of had some of that too. And well, when I put the new driveway in, they kind of tore up quite a bit of the grass. So we, we planted grass, so I was pretty excited about seeing some of that rain and snow. But... I'm over it now. I'm I'm fine with it. Okay, Chase has got a 2018 modified Shaw, and he was curious what updates he can do here to keep up with Ethan Ethan Dotson and the rest of the West Coast monsters. Car was updated in 2019. How much has technology changed since then? Well, keeping up with Ethan Dotson is going to be a challenge in its own. Um, that young man's one of the best racers I've ever had the privilege to work with. Um, he, he can, he's definitely a wheel man. Uh, you know, he's been around the sport quite a bit. Even though he's not very old, he's been around the sport a lot and he's learned it. I mean, it's kind of been his mission to learn about this sport and he's just kind of had an obsession of learning things and, He's very smart on setup. He's very smart on the car stuff. Um, you know, I, I would, uh, due to the fact he's got a Shaw car, I probably would, you know, be talking to Mr. Taylor or, or the people at Shaw. I, I'm not sure what I could tell you with the, the information that you're giving me. I don't know what I could tell you to help you there. But I can guarantee you keeping up with Ethan's going to be a challenge because he comes out here and in the summertime and runs out here. And, and we've got some pretty stellar competition out here in Iowa and not saying that the, the rest of the country doesn't, but you know, this, this, you race out here, these guys do a pretty good job and, and we've got the numbers to kind of back it up. So. Okay, so doing this. You're going to have to read some questions for me, Chad. Chris says, how much pinion angle should I have in an IMCA stock car at right height? I would say seven degrees. Seven degrees is a good standard pinion angle for pretty much everything. Um, yeah, seven degrees would be where I would go. Well, I wish I knew what was going on with my monitor here. Lindsay says, so what's the actual purpose of a load stick? Is it just a better fine tuning tool or just curious on the fence about buying one? So... The load stick, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you have a stock car or a modified or a sport mod, but the load stick basically is going to be a tool to help you change springs at the track. So once you have your car scaled and all ready to go, and just because you get a load stick doesn't mean you throw your scales away. Once the car is all scaled, ready to go, that's going to give you a benchmark center to centers on your on your four corners. So you're going to write that down, that number at ride height, all scaled. And we'll call that 19 inches on the right front. Then you put the car in the air, you take the tire and wheel off, take the shock off, put the load stick on, go to 19 inches. It's going to give you a number. Let's call it 500 pounds. So that number is going to be your benchmark. When you're at the racetrack and you want to change springs, then you would just take the spring out, put the new spring in, put the load stick on, go to that center to center, and then you wind the screw jack till you get to 500. 
then you go right to the speedway. So the old school way back uh, when I was a crew chief and we had to take measurements, rock the car, roll it, make sure everything was good, that we were perfect. And, and mind you, you're on a dirt pit area, on an angle, on a hillside, and there's a pothole. So it just takes all the guesswork out and, and allows you to change springs very accurately at the track. Second uh, version is it's a, a tool to tell you what's going on with your car. So you can put it on after you go out and make a run on the racetrack and you'll see where your shock travel is, uh, your down number, let's call it, uh, whether you paint the shock shaft with a Sharpie and watch where it wears off, uh, or you got the dust ring, don't go off the shock rubber, you pull on the racetrack or hit a hole, it'll get messed up through the bumps. Uh, then you get that down number, you come in the pit area, push the car down to that dust ring, let's call it, and then you'll take that center to center measurement Write that down, car in the air, tire and wheel off, stick on, collapse the suspension to that number, and that's your down number. Let's call that 1,200 pounds. Now you can tune with different springs, uh, different spring manufacturers on that down number, different spring rates. Uh, it's more important to tune that down number because that's where you want your best handling is in the middle of the corner when you're on full compression uh, and compare, you know, how you feel versus that down number. So on a night when you win the feature, you put the stick on, write that down. Then you're gonna know what you had that night. You go run five other races and you come back a month later and you're out to lunch, you can put the stick on and if it says you're 150 pounds off, then you know why you're out to lunch. So it's a tool that definitely uh, can help you tune at the racetrack, change springs accurately and uh, improve your, your program. But you're gonna to wanna to stay in your notebook and compare your car to your, you know, another manufacturer like you. Just because Joe Blow over there has 1,400 pounds at his down number doesn't mean you need 1,400 because shock mount locations are so critical on the load stick. So I hope that uh, clears it up for you. Okay, my screen is popping in and out to the point where I can't actually see the questions. Yeah, mine moved all over the place too here. I don't know if this is doing an update or something and it's I got that message again on my screen about the comments, but hey uh you know be live we just want the normal stuff. Yeah, just now it's putting questions on the bottom and they're on the side, but the ones in the middle you don't know where you're at, so you need to have a scrolling bar to to be able to look at them. So Well I mean, you used to could be able to, but this scrolling bar is not working tonight. Adam says he won a fee won the A feature Saturday night. Uh, his third night out with his new BHE shock package. Well, way to go, Adam. Congratulations. That's the kind of comments we like to see. Yeah, no doubt about that. That makes it <laughs> fun. Steven says, say you had a 15-inch, 200-pound spring in the left rear of a car and you went to a 16-inch, 150, and had achieved the same scale numbers and ride heights after the change. What effect would that have on the car? And is a four inch, four inches of spring split too much on a stock car? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, four inches of split, in my opinion, would be ideal with a, a stock car. We want to get that spring table so that that right rear is below that left rear, make the car roll a little bit. The stock cars, you know, have had a tendency to be a little bit short on side bite. And so that being said, um, you know, having that spring table being down on the right side or up on the left side is going to help that. The effect of going to that 150, that 150, you're going to compress it a little bit more. To get the same scale numbers, you're still going to compress that spring more because a 150, no matter whether it's a 16 inch or a 15 inch or whatever, it's still 150 pounds per inch where that 200 pound spring was 200 pounds per inch. What you're gonna see is when you go to accelerate, the car should get up on the, uh, kind of hike up a little bit more. Uh, I think that's a good a good combination. Um, it'd be interesting to see what you actually have for your right rear, but that left rear spring, that 150, that seems to be a common, uh, a pretty common, number that we're seeing people starting to go to 150s and 125s don's saying asking uh, caster camber settings suggestions on a usra 
B mod slash Wasota B mod? Um, well, caster and camber, you know, is that what the pinto spindles? I guess my first question is going to be: Is that with the pinto spindles or with the um, metric spindles? Uh, pinto spindles, you know, two and four degrees, two positive caster on the left, two po or four positive caster on the right, camber, uh, four positive on the on the left front and four and, and six to six and a half degrees negative on the right front. If you've got the pinos or the I'm sorry, if you have the metric spindles, I'd up the caster probably to three and six, uh, three on the left, six on the right. That's just my opinion. Jerry's asking, what's your thoughts on running a slider on the right rear and front and a shock in the rear instead of a coilover on a modified? Um, well, you know, it's they're, they're going to do the, kind of the same thing. Run that shock. My only concern with when you run the shock behind the housing, it gets less travel than it does on the front of the housing. Because when the rear end wraps and when you're in front of the housing, you're um, um, rolling into the spring, where when you're behind the housing, you're kind of rolling away from the spring um, just because the birdcage indexing and how the index rolls in the cage. So, like, if you're getting three inches of shock travel, uh, with a say a four valve rear shock, you're going to get two inches of shock travel behind the housing compared to three inches in the front. Um, granted, I understand probably what you're thinking is it's easier to change uh, shocks, which it, it is, but I've seen that sometimes that depending on the valving of the shock, uh, it, it, it might be a little bit, you might have to actually go a little bit softer when you go behind the housing, just because once again, I, I don't think it gets the movement that it would in, as it does in the front. But there would be advantages to it, especially for changing shock absorbers. Alan's got a question about anti-dive. Is there a difference in mounting upper, mounting upper A-frame mount staggered or parallel to the frame? Well, keep in mind when you use the phrase parallel to the frame, um, are you talking about like level with the world, with the, the main frame rails being level? Because uh, having a little bit of angle, you know, where the, the rear is a little bit lower than the front is going to actually put some anti-dive into the car. Now, that's one of those things that you kind of have to – kind of know a little bit about what you're doing as far as how much you actually do because you know, you're also going to change the caster gain and then there's you know just anti-dive itself is just not the only thing that's that's changing there so uh, i i believe that anti-dive has an advantage especially run with some of the softer spring stuff i think it has its advantage but you got to be careful not to get too much because too much anti dive can snap the you know snap the tire loose because what happens is is anti dive really only works when you're on the brakes. So when you go into the corner to get on the brakes, it could shear the tire off. If you had too much anti dive, it could actually shear the traction of the tire. Well, I don't know about you, but my screen's just freaking popping and going and just doing all kinds of. Hey, we talked beforehand. Your Monday was going to be. Yeah. I'm like, I think there's some, somebody is uh, uh, doing something here. Hopefully mine stays normal. Jeff's yeah. asking, what does moving the pull bar up or down at the front do on an IMCA sport mod? Um, moving it up or down, when you put more angle in it, moving it down is going to probably create more traction. Uh the traction won't last as long, but it definitely will create more traction on a stop and go type situation. 
the trend has been actually moving them up and flattening them out, flattening them out seems to make the car the, the, the problem with a sport mod and the, and the problem that the two link kind of has is they're a little sensitive or they can be a little sensitive in the middle of the corner to the point where you can get it's pretty easy to get a throttle push so we've actually seen guys raising them up on the front and leveling it out a little bit because it seems to maintain good traction off the corner but it delays that traction in the middle of the corner to the point where it kind of eliminates that that throttle push or minimizes that throttle push travis has a limit chain question what effects would lengthening and mine just shuffled <laughs> what effects would lengthening the left rear chain limiter do on a sport mod well, when you lengthen it, you're going to get more. When you when you lengthen it, you're going to get more trailing arm angle, which in, in turn, more trailing arm angle is going to give you more steer. It should also give you more traction. The the problem sometimes, like I said, with the with the um, two link cars, unless you're running an open motor the crate motors they can be a little bit throttle sensitive to the point where they you know they don't have we, we can get too much left rear traction in the car um so you got to be a little careful there because if you do lengthen it you're going to get more traction but you're also going to get more rear steer so um they should counteract each other but sometimes they don't because, like I said, what happens is is it can actually make the car too responsive in the middle of the corner. Alex is asking, what's your thoughts on engine covers between the hood and door on the driver's side of a modified? My thought is less air under, less that less air would be getting under the deck and lifting the car. Well, I think you're 100% right on that. If the rules allow it, um, I would run an engine cover, just kind of keep keep that air from going, trying to get that air across. Plus the fact that now all of a sudden, if you can run an engine cover, you've got a, sort, a side board on the front of the car, which with an open wheel car, that's kind of been the problem. We've got a big quarter panel, we've got a big door. And so we actually need a little bit more airflow or air side force on the front end so in my opinion if, if the rules allow it i would definitely run one and we're building a ump car right now that we are building a, a cover for it and uh, that's it looks pretty slick yeah so i got a little bit of asphalt experience so you want the an asphalt or uh you know, NASCAR style racing, the, the right side and the nose are sealed off and the left side is is open to let the air suck out from underneath the car. It creates downforce. So drop the right side quarter panel and raise the left rear quarter panel. Makes Blaze, sense. Blaze says uh, some chassis, oh, it shuffles every time I start reading. Some chassis builders and, dri and drivers themselves are going away from scales and going to just ride heights, any advantages or disadvantages of that? Um, wow, that's I'll load stick. That one, Chad. Well, you, you, like I said earlier with the load stick, I mean, just because you have a smash machine and a load stick doesn't mean you throw your scales away. And just because that chassis builder is doing all of his stuff off the, the load stick or the smash machine, it still boils down to you having that car balanced and the weight all correct. So... Uh, you can't just throw your scales away. Don't sell your scales to get a smasher. Don't sell your scales to get a load stick. Uh, the scales are the first step in the evolution of setting that race car up, and you're, they're essential. I mean, if you move 20-pound chunk of lead around, you're changing the, the ride height of that corner, which essentially changes that center to center distance for either the load stick or the load machine. So when a chassis builder has them numbers dialed, that means that they know that your car is 54% left side, 56% rear. They know all them center to centers are perfect, and they can give you your four load numbers and get them cars pretty close going out the door. But you still, I feel, need to have scales when you're when you're setting your car up, you know, because you're always going to be changing little things with your lead and your balance. Anything to add to that? Well, I agree with it 100% because you still, 
you know, you hit the nail on the head. You, you still got to have a balanced race car, and to ensure the fact that you have a balanced race car, that's where your, your scale numbers are going to come into play, because you're still going to have to have a certain amount of left right left side percentage, a certain amount of rear percentage. Now, with the new technology and, and taking measurements, once you have the car scaled and you load stick, I'm not saying that you can't. The, you know, you you don't necessarily have to put the car on scales every night. After that fact, I think the scales need to be a deal where when you start getting out in left field, let's come back to home page, square everything all up, check everything, make sure. But and that's the advantage of the load stick is once you've got the car all balanced, now you've got your numbers. So you've got a specific set of numbers in your notebook that you can go by, and you can constantly go back to those numbers. And like I said, for the most part, I, I think that you, you could probably maintain the car quite a bit with just right heights and, and, and load stick numbers once it's been scaled uh, and, and you still have your scale so you can always go back to it to make sure. Dawson's asking, let's say you have a, your Panner bar mount for a Northern Sport Mod. You have the two climbers, one in the inside and one on the outside. Would you gain more traction by putting it to the inside mount? Um, Are we on the well, frame, side, right. frame if side? If you go to the inside mount on the frame, you're going to increase your angle, and you're going to end up with a shorter bar, if I'm understanding that correctly. The shorter bar is going to probably, I don't know if I would say it's going to give you any more traction. Uh, it's going to give you quicker side bite, which in turn can relate to traction because the rear end stuck better. But I tend to, myself, tend to like the longer bar, you know, like the 21-inch Panard bar, or J-bar, I mean. I, I think that's pretty good. Is this a sport mod, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Traction wise, you're not going to notice the difference one way or the other. It's just you're going to, with the shorter one, you're going to have a little more angle, is all. Rob's asking in a three link modified, what kind of characteristics will the car have if the rear end is setting too far to the right? Uh, you're going to tote the left front tire like no tomorrow. Uh, the car's going to have a tremendous amount of side bite, the car's going to get in. Roll on the right rear quite a bit, lift the left front, carry the left front all the way off the corner. And most of the time when you see somebody that's toting the left front a lot or they tote the left front instantly, the rear end's too far to the right. Or I mean too far to the left. Yeah, I think he's asking too far to the right. If the if it's too far to the right, the car is gonna do exactly the opposite. The car's gonna be a little bit freer getting in. Uh, you're gonna have to put more panard bar in it. Uh, or more J bar in it, one one way or the other, because the car is going to be too free getting into the corner. Yeah, it's not the screens, Phil. It's just our the way our questions pop in when the questions move on us and shuffle down the screen. Uh, Don was talking about a GRT with Pinto Pinto spindles earlier on the Castor Camber deal. Oh, okay. So yeah, you'd be that two and four degrees positive caster. Uh, four degrees positive camber on the left on the left front and six and a half degrees negative camber on the right front. Kyle's asking, what's your opinion on left rear chain drop on dry slick? Add drop or take drop away? Well, it kind of depends on what you're actually wanting to do. Um, the the trend is to take a little bit of drop out of it so it takes a little steer out of it. The downside to that is when you take a little bit of drop out of the left rear, you also take right front out of it too. So in other words, when you limit the travel on the left rear with a chain, you're also going to limit the amount of travel that gets over on the right front too because whenever the left rear gains, it tends to go to the right front. So I would be a little careful there, but as a rule of thumb, taking a little chain out of it on a dry slick racetrack seems to be common because uh, we want to take a little steer out of it. 
Alan was referring from side to side. I think that was the spring split deal, I think, so that should be taken care of. Raymond, how many degrees of anti-dive is a good starting point for a stock car? Well, if rules allow you to change it, um, you know, on the right front, we run half to three quarters of a degree on the right front of our modified cars, and then about two degrees on our left front. Now, some guys run a whole lot more than that, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a real big believer because once again, if you, if your driver's a brake stabber, um, boy, that's just the worst thing we could ever have. If you've got a bunch of uh, anti-dive in the car, and now all of a sudden we get a bunch of front brake in it and, and it shears the traction in the tires, so... This is one of them things where it's always, you know, you're comparing, well, this guy's got a 500 in the right front. I should put a 500 in the right front. Exactly. He's got a quarter inch more anti-dive than you. Them two 500s ain't acting anything close to the same. That's, no. I know we, we scream it all the time and, and we're serious. And there's little things like this that everybody doesn't think about and they overlook is that you got to stay in your notebook and listen to your chassis builder and your crew chief in your notebook. Because yeah. if you, if you run a 500 just because a rage has a right front and your GRT has a degree less anti-dive, them things ain't even close to the same. That's an anti-dive is huge. I mean, that's, that's a big, big change in, in spring rate in the right front of the car for sure. Very big change. People don't have, have any, I mean, it's, it's a major, major deal. So if you start playing with that, just be careful. Dan uh, is saying, asking, if I took some QA1 shocks and made a 314 front and right rear side and a 14 threes on the left side, what would that do? You might want to read the, the, the 314 on the right front. Is that a, yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Is that a three compression 14 rebound? Yeah, that's yeah three. Um, it depends on your spring rate. If you're oh, running fairly, three. I got it. So three fourteens on the front and rear right side, and fourteen threes on the left side. That can't be right. Well, you might want to give us a little more insight there. That that could very well be possible on your right front and your left rear. I don't think I would want them on my left front and my right rear. Not sure. Sounds like you need to call BHE and get some shocks. Bob? Yeah, I think that sounds like a great idea to me. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, 314, like I said, that's, and see, the problem is, you know, it's just, I don't know. I'm old school, but probably none of you young guys remember Paul Harvey because he always used to say, and then there's the rest of the story. Well, <laughs> that's kind of the thing with shock absorbers because we don't know what the zero point is on a shock absorber. We don't know what the one, two, three inch number is because you could have a 314 that has a bunch of bleed in it and, and that thing might respond to like a, like a three, six or something like that. So it's hard to really say, but if using those numbers, providing that all the information is correct, a uh, 314 is not a bad number on the right front. Might be a little soft on compression. Might. Uh, just depends. If you're running a if you're running a 600 pound spring in the right front, that three is probably going to be fine. If you're running a 450, that three is going to be way too soft. You'll need to be in the, something into a, towards a five. That left rear, 14-3, that's not a bad combination. That's pretty common. That, that's, that would be a, an excellent left rear. You wouldn't want them on the left front or the right rear. Those need to be more of a closed-up shock, more of a standard, you know, like four, five, three, four in that neighborhood. Um, they need to be not as big a split between the rebound and the compression. 
Ted is uh, asking, I see some BMODs running the pull bar just above the rear end housing instead of 11 or 12 inches up. What would be the effect from doing that? Well, with it being a solid bar, you're not going to see as much effect. However, um, the closer you run it to the rear end, the, the quicker the traction will be. Um, it, it, it seems to be when you, the further you, the further you run it away from it, it, it seems to, um, but the problem is, is sometimes the traction can be almost too quick. So you've got to be really careful with that. Um, it definitely has more straight line traction. Um, I know when we've run a, a, as a pull bar, we have to run a lot stiffer spring on a, a a pull bar with closer to the rear end because your leverage you don't you don't you know you don't have the leverage factor you don't lose the leverage factor like you do further away from the rear end old number seven garage says what's going on fellas good to hear you uh, watching again there timmy if you guys are you know get home at night and you're thinking about turning the tv on just just don't waste your time turn youtube on Watch some of these uh, these YouTubers like Old Number Seven Garage and some high quality short track racing TV. It's uh, way better than any mainstream crap you're gonna watch at night anyway. Travis says a question: Track is rough, and your right front bottoms out lap after lap. What would be your first adjustment? Be to bottom out less hard and maintain speed. Possibly anti-dive, since we're on anti-dive tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, read that to me again. Is bottoming out. Uh, track is rough, and your right front bottoms out lap after lap. What would be the first thing you would adjust to bottom out less? Um, well, if it's bottoming out, the right front's bottoming out, I would definitely make sure I, I would understand. I would look to see how much chain I have in my left rear because if, if, if my left rear is getting a lot of movement, I can kind of choke that up a little bit by restricting some of the movement on the left rear. That could very well be possible. Um, you can raise your right heights, but the problem is when you raise the right heights, you're kind of crutching it. It's kind of like the old saying goes, you know, if, if, if you're a foot away from the wall and you hit the wall, you're going to hit the wall. If you're five foot away from the wall and you hit the wall, you're definitely going to probably have a, more of an issue with damage than you would uh, in another situation. So once again, uh, raising the right heights, yeah, that, that might that might be an idea, but uh, I don't think so. And, you know, maybe it just ends up being wherever you're running. Like if you were at I-80 this weekend, I had a couple customers that complained about the same thing, that they were having problems bottoming out. And with that racetrack being so fast, uh, you know, it's very possible that's a racetrack that might just need more spring rate, uh, you know. And when you, and the thing is a lot of times people will think, well, I'm just going to increase the spring rate on the right front. Well, actually, if I was to increase the spring rate, I would increase the spring rate equally. So I would stiffen my whole front end rather than just stiffening up my right front. That way I don't change my balance of my car quite as much. RJ Merchant, I am seeing modified. What's a good starting trail number and how do you measure that correctly? Well, depending on the brand of the car, your, your trail, you actually need to probably talk to your chassis manufacturer to see how they actually measure it. Some people measure it from the motor plate. That being said, if the motor plate's put in the car square with the world. Now, I know there's a couple of chassis builders that their motor doesn't set in their car completely square, uh, so you can't measure off the motor plate. Um, you can't measure off the, the lower ball joint grease search because if you've got a turn stub. Uh, so that's just one of those situations where you almost have to find out from your chassis builder where there's a jig point that you can measure off of that 
is square with the world. Dawson's asking, how do you increase side bite in an IMCA sport mod? Um, moving the rear end uh, slightly to the left, that's going to increase side bite. And, and when I say slightly, an eighth to a quarter of an inch is, is a is substantial, that's a significant change on those cars. You could put more uh, panard bar angle in it. Um, that's definitely going to get you more side bite. Sometimes, though, that can, uh, yeah, I don't know if your screen's doing what my screen's doing, Chad, but I'm, I'm going to have to have a Budweiser or something after this deal. Holy moly. My eyes are going, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't it's think. A lot. <laughs> anyway, maybe two okay. of them. I think I'll have one for me and one for you. We'll grind through it. There we go. Anyway, the, uh, Side bite, like I said, that's uh, more J bar or more panard bar with a sport mod. It'd be a panard bar. More panard bar angle is going to give you more. But the quickest and easiest way is moving that rear end. Just one turn, two turns at the most will make a big difference. Jeff Green, what is the max left upper bar angle on an A mod, and where do you jack the car up to check it? Well, the max bar angle, in, in my, you know, just in, in my opinion, I've never really, I wouldn't go over 50 degrees uh, in dynamic. And when I'm saying dynamic, basically take your load stick and and cramp, clamp down the right front so that you're right down over in the right front so you get that in dynamic. Jack underneath the seat so that you get the uh, up against the chain. And then whatever that is there, I wouldn't be over 50. I never used to go over 45, but now with the zero indexing plates, we've advanced that up to 50 degrees, and, and that works pretty good. 50 degrees in dynamic is probably in the 28 to 30 degrees in static. Aaron's asking, what's your thoughts on the 9010 going forward or standard? versus running it behind the rear end, like a push style, what's the difference? So Rayburn style or standard? I don't really, to be honest with you, think that there's gonna be a lot of difference one way or the other. Uh, and it, it would be a different rate. Um, it would have to be a different rate shock because if yeah. you're going off of compression, you'd have to be Instead of a 90-10, you'd want a 10-90. And in front of the rear end, you'd want the 90-10. Yeah, I'd say the disadvantage of going back is you don't have that tightening up on entry, you know, being hooked in front and pushing the left rear basically down in the racetrack. It's still going to do what you want it to do on the axle wrap thing, but right. uh, that would probably be the only difference going back. That's going to take some side bite out of the car. It's going to make the car a little bit less tight getting in. Old number seven garage. We ran the hell out of it over the weekend. Won the heat, second in the feature. Notes off this program pays off every time. Thanks, guys. Well, we appreciate you watching. Yeah, we did. Let's do it. I, I think that's awesome. I'm glad you had a good weekend. I mean, you know, first and second is pretty good. Matt's asking, what are the pros and cons of running Pro Dive in the right front of a sport, sport mod? Um, I've never you. actually experimented with that, so to be honest with you, I really couldn't answer that question. Um, I, yeah, I, I couldn't answer that question. Well, what we were talking about earlier with car bottom and all, you put pro dive in it, you better be ready to put spring rate in it. So, again, these are this is we're we're touching on a pro dive and a dive, and you know it's kind of going on the roll center thing, and you get a whole bunch of these little variables that your chassis builder dials in over the years getting these cars you know tuned if you're going to start playing with that you got to understand that once you put pro dive or put anti dive in it changes the spring rate of that car too so you're you're not only changing one thing but you're, you're changing another so you really need to be careful and like bob said earlier a quarter inch is a, a big change yeah no that that's a huge change and going to pro dive especially would be a, a major change 
So when we went back in the day, okay, let's rewind a quick story, but sure. pro dive and anti dive in an asphalt car back in the day, I would tune according to the racetrack banking. So if I was going to a flat track, I'd want that thing to dive on the right front and rotate. If I was going to some bank track where you had a lot of bank, you didn't really need it to, you didn't need to dive because the, the G force was going to dive it for you. So that's one rule of thumb that I always used back in the day. If you need, if you're on a flat track and need to rotate, you're going to need that pro more pro drive or less anti dive. And then when you get to a big speedway, you want anti dive so it doesn't dive because you have the automatic G force or centrifugal force to get that car on the right front. So wrap your head around that. But that's what I used to do back in the day on the asphalt stuff. Well, and the thing is, is, you know, those are going to be advantages for that guy that's a trail breaker. Mr. Smooth on the brakes. If you're wide open, Charlie, and slam, jump, bang, wang, everything on the brake pedal, that doing that stuff on the front end is going to drive you insane. And asphalt, that's why it was more important, because you're going in the corners miles over your head, and you're trying to control this thing and slow it way down. So they're on the brakes a lot more than you ever are on a dirt car, unless you're a really good trail breaker. Logan, what's a good size left rear spring to start with? Pros and cons of a tall, tall and short spring. Well, I still stick with the 16 inch spring. I mean, some sanctioning bodies have a rule that you can only run a 16 inch spring. I still like a 16 inch spring with a 13 inch right rear, 16 inch left rear. I think it's a good combination for your, uh, uh, the, the roll, the, the spring table in the back of the car, I think that's a good combination. When you go softer on that left rear spring, you're going to need a taller spring so that as it compresses, you still have your uh, roll like you want it to be. So in my opinion, I'm not I was never a real big believer in that 20 inch spring. I think what happens with that 20 inch spring, you get so much spring that now all of a sudden the springs start to flex in there. And once the spring starts to flex, it, it, it takes the consistency out of it, in my opinion. Mike learns watching. He says, always a great show, guys. Jason's asking, what type of shock do you all recommend for a rough track and an A mod? gas oil or base valve well a base valve shock a, a gas shock for sure definitely i tend to like a base valve gas shock which is you know that that's the best of the both worlds and if I wasn't running IMCA, I would be running uh, Schrader valves so I could adjust my gas pressure and increase the gas. And on a rough racetrack, I'd put an extra 20 pounds of gas pressure in that shock. So people think that gas pressure is the same thing as spring rate. Well, I, actually, it's not. They, may, may, they might have some similarities, but a little bit more gas pressure can because the gas pressure can only go so far it's kind of like blowing up a balloon inside of a tube it can only get so big and then that's you're, you're done and then it just gets stiffer so that would be my opinion uh, i definitely an oil shock would not be my preference on that type of condition those are great shocks but they work the best on dry slick smooth racetracks Ryan's asking, pull bar shock on a four-link IMCA mod, is it a must-have or kind of up-in-the-air driver preference? Well, I believe it still is a must-have because I think it, it definitely plays into the fact that it helps tighten the car up getting into the corner. Now, what, where the difference comes into play is depends on what fifth core or, or what uh, pull bar you have in the car. If you've got a, a, a pull bar with a spring in it, you're going to need a stiffer compression, more like a 90-10 type shock. If you've got a biscuit bar, you're going to need to have something more like a 6-1, 6-2 in that type of situation 
because once again, it just helps the car get a little extra side back getting into the corner, makes the car a little bit snugger on corner entry. Todd, uh, Todd McFarland, how would how would putting a 20 on the right front instead of a 19 affect the handling? Well, I don't think it's actually going to affect the handling a tremendous amount. The only problem that I don't like about the 20 is it's a crowned tire. So in my opinion, it doesn't have quite the level surface that the uh, – 19 inch has i can see why you'd want to do that so you could get a, their stagger would be easier to get but if you look at the picture in, in fact actually if you go back and and remember at the school we kind of showed that that 19 inch tire like i said it's kind of a crown tire because it's basically a, the 20 inch tire is basically a 19 inch tire expanded is all it really is it's no different sidewall and nothing like that um that kind of thing so in, in my opinion i think you, you would have better handling with a pair of 19s with the stagger on it is my answer to that question sandra's asking what do you typically do with tire pressure for different track surfaces add or reduce air for heavier slick um i would definitely probably add some air pressure for a slick racetrack um i think and now i'm sorry i said that totally wrong i would add air more for a heavier racetrack because i don't want the tire to be rolling underneath uh, i want to make sure that the sidewall is not rolling underneath because what happens when the sidewall rolls underneath it buckles the tread and you lose actual traction that way because now all of a sudden i don't have my full surface of the tire on the ground so and dry slick wise, you got to be a little careful. You don't want to decrease air pressure a lot. But, you know, if you're not running nitrogen, you can start off low and, and then see kind of where it goes from there. But, you know, as a rule of thumb, I don't change air pressures a whole lot. If it's a real rough racetrack, I'll put an extra pound in my right side tires. Otherwise, I don't mess with it a lot. Matt Ruff, thanks for all you guys do. One, two features this weekend. Appreciate all the suggestions and advice. That's awesome news. Awesome. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, some guy named Jeff Taylor wants uh, wants to know what's the optimum right rear suspension cage drop on shock mount? <laughs> well, um, six and a half inches is my opinion, but uh, I that's that's just what I've, I've always used. One inch higher than the left rear. Yep. That would be a good combination. Nice to see you alive, Jeff. We yeah. Talked in a while. Did you lose my phone number? <laughs> Kenson, when is the best time to adjust right rear chain on a B-Mod? Well... Probably never. Um, I'm. You can adjust the chain, the right rear chain, if you're on a really super smooth, slick racetrack. But if there's any ripples or if there's any pulls or anything like that in that racetrack, that is the worst thing you can do as far as crutching your handling. It makes traction. It definitely makes traction. But when that drops in that hole, it's going to gain a bunch of traction. And uh, so, yeah, just one of those deals. Billy went to Fountain City last week and had his chain a little too tight. He did. That'll happen. I mean, I, it's like I say, it makes traction. But boy, you drop that right rear in a hole and it makes traction, and that right front's going to be going the opposite direction you're going to want it to go michael's asking how does the laterally angle of the left rear bar affect the chassis on a two link i assume we're talking bar toe there lateral location bar toe on a two link well uh i still believe you know it's, let's uh, let's go back to the old way back when in fact they run these cars last year with these same deals 
the old rear suspension that everybody used to run back in the day, the truck trailing arm. How is that truck trailing arm on those asphalt cars to get more traction equally? They towed them in in the front and split them out and made them wider in the back. I always kind of do the same thing. I tow the left rear in about two inches, and I only tow the right rear in an inch. It's going to affect steer, but still, in my opinion, it's still pointing. I, I like to see that left rear pointing more towards the right front, you know, or, or a little bit more angle there within a reason. Aaron, UMP mod, slightly snug on entrance and middle, rear end washing out, tailing out on exit, high banked half mile. What would be your go-to first move you would make to try to correct? You might need to read that one again. Tight in and the middle. Rear end is washing out, tailing out on exit, high banked half mile. What's your first move? Um, I would free the car up on corner entry because what's happening is, is the car is tight on corner entry. It's, it's getting over on the right rear too hard. And what's happening is, is when you get over on the right rear, it sticks the right rear. And then you get on the throttle and now all of a sudden it starts to push. And then it pushes a little bit more until you finally get enough throttle in it to snap the tail loose. And then once you snap the car loose, you're going to hang the tail until you just get to the next corner and that's just how that's going to work so the, the main thing is the car is too tight um if it's a four-link car i'd raise my right lower bar up one hole put a little bit more steer in that right rear if, and if it's a two-link car i'd do the same thing i'd raise my right trailing arm up on the frame one hole put a little bit more steer in it and try to get the car freed up move the rear end a little bit to the right that would help free it up a little bit. You could try, if, if rules allow, you could wheel spacer, uh, put a half inch spacer in that right rear. That's definitely going to help it. Biggest problem is the car's too tight getting in. That's what's causing all the problems. Hey, we made Jeff Taylor laugh out loud. <laughs> yeah. Well, nice to see you there, buddy. Jeff, I haven't talked to you for a while. You were going to call me one, one day, and that's been six weeks ago, and I guess I forgot. Taylor time. Uh, I'm, I need to be patient. Beth is asking, I'm sure you're tired of this subject tonight, but if putting anti-dive in the right front, what effect does that have on the spring rate? Well, when you put more anti-dive in the front end, you can run a softer spring because what's happening when you go in the corner and you get on the brakes, the anti-dive is trying to hold the car up so you can run a softer spring. That was the theory behind running more anti-dive. You could go into the corner and a, and a guy that's really good, like a Jeff Taylor or Kelly Shryock or those guys that are really good with the brakes, can roll that thing in, keep that car kind of from diving down on the brake while they're on the brake. And then once it gets more to the middle of the corner, when they get off the brake, the car would turn, drive, dive down on the right front and turn a little better. That was the theory behind it. Problem is... Not everybody is that smooth of a brake driver, and they're, half the guys don't even use brakes. If you don't use brakes, this anti-dive is not going to be, I mean, you could put a half an inch in it, and you're not going to notice a handling characteristic, with the exception of that you would have gained a bunch of caster, I mean, you, you gained some caster gain. Uh, other than that, that's really all you're going to accomplish if you don't use brakes. Tyson's asking, should you go to a softer spring rate on a slick track to tighten up the car? Example, going from a 225 in the grip to a 200 in the slick, assuming right rear. Um, I'd highly recommend that because what you're going to do, that spring rate's going to give you, you know, in the old adage, you when know, we talk about this in the schools, the stiffer spring gets the weight. So once the car goes to roll, a softer spring will actually – compress and not load the tire as much. A stiffer spring will still try to compress, but it, it takes that load and drives it right to the tire and actually gives the car more side bite. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem with that is, is if you stay in the throttle too long or you're not real smooth on the throttle, 
that stiffer spring is going to tend to want to make the car a little freer up off the corner. So you might have to make an adjustment, you know, like put an eternal lead in the car or something like that to get the car to come up off the corner. Um, you know, those type of things. But in, in overall, that stiffer spring is definitely going to give you more side bite. And just like that, it's 8 o'clock. And then just like that, it's 8 o'clock. And so today is the 25th. So we'll be back here on May 9th. God, I'll have had a birthday by then. Holy moly. 64 or what? Yeah, i will be right in that neighborhood. Yeah, we're getting there, we're getting there closer. <laughs> Every year we get a little closer to that number. No doubt about that. But anyway... Well, thanks, guys, for coming on here tonight. We had a lot of great questions and a lot of information, and and uh, uh, appreciate appreciate all you guys coming in there. Nice to hear from you there, Jeff. And uh, we'll let you guys have a great week, couple weeks, and we'll see you here in a couple weeks. Thanks, Chad. Yep. Thanks, guys. I can't even get out of it. It's Monday. <laughs> wow. I'm just going to have to shut my computer down. We'll All see right. you later. Talk to you soon. Yep.